Hey guys, welcome back to First Person Radio. Uh, this is going to be part three of my video on the Quanshang UVK58, and I'm going to be demonstrating how to use this for radio direction finding. So we did a brief intro to the radio earlier, some of the nice features I like about it, a brief intro of the spectrum analyzer function, which allows you to find unknown signals within like a range of frequencies that you can search. And then today we're going to be showing how to use some of the, the details of the spectrum analyzer function uh, to pair with a directional antenna and start doing radio direction finding to figure out where those signals are coming from. Uh, so the tools I have today in addition to the Quanshang is uh, this big Christmas tree antenna right here. It's called a Yagi antenna. And this is a stacked Yagi. So the three large elements there are for about 440 megahertz. And then these small elements in the middle there also work at, uh, sorry, the three large elements are at 140 megahertz. And these small elements there are roughly 440 megahertz. So this is a dual band VHF and UHF Yagi. Uh, I also have two different loop antennas here. Uh, one of them is the Aero Antennas direction finding loop. And then another is a homebrew loop uh, that was based on a design by RASA. I think it was the Radio Amateur Society of Australia. They have a really good YouTube video on building one yourself for cheap. Uh, so comparing these, uh, the big Yagi antenna is also usable for transmit and it works both ways. It receives better in the direction it's pointed, but it also transmits better in that direction. And the gain on this one, uh, it depends on the band. The more elements you have, the more uh, the more gain you have, and uh, the big three element one is going to be you know seven or eight decibels of gain, and then the smaller one is probably going to be more like nine. I'd have to look up the specs, uh, but point is there's one direction this way where you point it that it gets the most reception, and that's how you can use it to find where signals are coming from. Uh, the loop antennas are a little bit different, but we'll get into those later. So let's get started. Um, I have set up a extremely low power transmitter uh, on the uh, ham band, the two meter ham band. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to search. So let's see, I'll switch to VFOA, change it to frequency mode, and I'll start at say 144. I'll search from 144 to 146 megahertz. So I'm going to do 144. Oops, hold on. 144, and then I'm going to set my other VFO to 146, and now I'm going to hold 5. That sets my scan range, and now I'm going to hit function 5, and now I'm scanning between 144 and 146 with the spectrum analyzer. So now let's plug in our Yagi antenna. This is within the range of that three element Yagi. So I should get a pretty good, you know, seven or so decibels of gain in the direction the Yagi is pointed. So let's see if we find something. All right, there's my signal. All right. So I'm going to turn the volume down because we don't need to listen to it. But that's the transmitter that I have set up. So you'll see that that shows up as a big old spike on my spectrum analyzer. And it's at 145.6. So now that I've found my signal of interest, I'm going to click the transmit button. And now I'm in the detailed menu. And now I have my S meter and my signal strength. So I'm just going to take this Yagi and it doesn't really, I say it doesn't really matter if you have it horizontally or vertically. It does. If the antenna that you're trying to track is oriented vertically, it'll receive better when your Yagi is pointed vertically. If the antenna is horizontal, it'll receive better if it's pointed horizontal. But either way, it's still directional. So I'm just going to leave it vertical. And I'm going to go in at least a complete 360 and look for the highest point of that signal. So I'm turning around. Signal is dropping a little. Gets higher. Gets lower. I'm sorry, you probably can't see this very well. But I'm going to look at the highest point of that signal. I'm at negative 82 right here. And I start getting smaller, negative 87, 82. So I turn all the way around 
and I see that negative 82 is about the strongest signal I get, and it's in about this direction, right here. And up there is the little park bench where I put my transmitter, right? So that's how you get a bearing. Uh, you get more than one bearing, you can plot them out on a map if you know your location. And uh, that's how you use a Yagi for radio direction finding with the Quan Shang. So let's back out and do that exact same thing with the loop antenna. Now the loop antenna is a little different. So the Yagi only works for the frequencies it's designed for. This one will work for 144 plus or minus a little bit and 440 plus or minus a little bit. The loop antennas, these will work for anything below the frequency that they were, the, the highest frequency that they're, they're rated for. So this one here supposedly is good to like, you know, seven, 600 megahertz, if I recall correctly. Anything below it should track, but I would verify that. I've had a hard time tracking 440 signals with this guy. But, but anyway, let's back back out. So I have, I've set my top to 144, my bottom to 146. That's my scan range. I'm gonna hold five to set scan range and then function five to open the spectrum analyzer. I plug in my antenna. And there's my signal at 145.6. You can see it's a little bit weaker, significantly weaker. Loop antennas aren't as sensitive, but it's still there, All right? And if I move my squelch down, I can still hear it, All right? So now the way the loop antenna works is kind of the opposite of the Yagi. Instead of looking for the strongest signal, I'm gonna look for the weakest signal. In the plane of this loop, there are two nulls where it will not receive a signal, right? Like if my shadow is emitting a signal, I'll hear it, I'll hear it, I'll hear it, and then as soon as it's directly pointing at it, it would go away. And then as I turn around, it would come back. And then as I turn all the way around, it would go away again, right? So I can get an azimuth by turning around and looking for when my signal goes away. But I don't know if it's an azimuth to my signal or a back azimuth. I have no way of knowing until I take more than one measurement. So let's do that. Let me see if I can get my... There. Sorry, it's a little hard to read here in the daylight. So you'll see I'll start turning. My signal is nice and strong. Signal is strong. My signal drops pointing in this direction, comes back up, comes back up, and at 180 degrees opposite, it drops again, right? So my radio signal is coming from either that direction, which is the correct direction, that's where I put it, or 180 degrees opposite. No way to know, except I take one bearing, I plot it on a map, and then I go and I walk off 90 degrees and then if I walk off way to the side and take another bearing, I can plot where those two lines intersect. And that will tell me which direction it's coming from. But the advantage of the loop is that the loop is a lot smaller and a lot easier to pack. And that's why I kind of prefer loops if I can get away with it. But definitely test your loops out before, actually test all of these out before in like a controlled setting before you actually try and like take them to like a fox hunt competition or something. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the loops are, are really handy and easier to carry around. And they also get a much more precise bearing. Your Yagi has got like, you know, like a 20 or 30 degree cone where it's, uh, you know, like a 20 or 30 degree cone where it's pretty strong and it's sometimes hard to find the exact middle. On your loop antenna, it's a much narrower range where the frequency is, is uh, dead on. Or sorry, the frequency is dead on. It's a much narrower range uh, where the, 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 signal, the signal dips. It's a much narrower uh, arc. It's much more precise for a bearing. Okay, well, uh, that's, uh, that's the gist of it uh, for using a loop or a Yagi. Uh, this loop here is going to be more or less the same thing. These are made out of coaxial cable. Uh, I can provide a link to the RASA YouTube videos on how to make these. All you need is you need some coax, you need an X-Acto knife because it won't focus on the top here. You break the shield, the outer braid of the coax here, and leave the middle intact. And then one of these is connected normally. Wow, will this please focus? Okay. One of these is connected normally 
where uh, the outer is connected to the body and then the pin is connected to the center. And on the other one, you only connect the outer and not the pin. And then you have a little a T junction here. And this loop performs identically, as far as I can tell, to that arrow antennas loop. Uh, that one is 80 bucks. It's a lot higher quality, probably, probably a little more reliable. You're not less likely to screw it up, right? You just buy it. And definitely more durable, uh, but this one, uh, this one will work if you're just trying to play around with stuff. So I hope that was helpful. Uh, this entire setup, uh, you can get into radio direction finding for under 50 bucks. $30, $35 radio and a homemade loop, or you can also home make a Yagi. There's plans out there for what are called tape measure Yagis that look pretty easy to build. I haven't made one myself. Uh, but they will work just as well as a commercially built one. So it doesn't have to be expensive, and it doesn't have to be super complicated either. Uh, so I hope this uh, will inspire someone to get out and uh, try it in the field. I almost forgot there were a couple of tips that I wanted to give uh, for taking a bearing. So the first tip is uh, the, your location. Uh, you're going to want a place with a good line of sight, so somewhere high up. It doesn't really matter if there's plants around you, but uh, you want to be somewhere high so that you're going to have the greatest chance of receiving the radio signal. Uh, also, and this is really, really important, avoid large metal objects. Don't stand right next to your car. Uh, don't stand right next to uh, like a ball field, uh, like one of those big backstops for a ball field or a goal post or a lamp post or any you know big metal sided building. What those will do is they will reflect the radio signals and you're going to get all sorts of false bearings. Um, also, uh, if you're trying to uh, take a bearing, make sure you turn all the way around in a complete circle at least once. You might have noticed when we were taking bearings that there's a bunch of peaks and valleys, right? It kind of goes higher, lower, higher, lower. And then the highest or the lowest is going to be where you're going to take your bearing from, depending on your type of antenna, right? On a Yagi, the highest peak is probably your bearing. And on a loop, the lowest null is probably the bearing. Uh, if you can't get a very good bearing, or if with the loop antennas especially, you notice that you, know, you don't get a null on each side, it might be because you're not really getting a uh, direct signal. You might be getting signals bounced off of buildings or landscapes or whatever. So if you can't get a clear null or a clear peak, depending on you know, what you're looking for, uh, maybe try a different location. I've found that to be really, really frustrating. Uh, that happens to me a lot, uh, where I just can't quite get a good bearing from a particular location, and I just have to go somewhere else. So if you're like writing these down and plotting them out on a map, it's also useful to plot out how strong the signal was and how clear the bearing was. The stronger the signal, the closer you are to it, generally, and the clearer the bearing was, like the more pronounced that peak or valley might indicate you know, the quality of it, right? Like, this one was not very clear. I'm not really going to take that into account too much. Uh, if it points off in a different direction than all the rest, that's because it was a, it was a, it was a false bearing. Last tip, uh, you might also want one of these. So this is an attenuator. Uh, my, the markings have already worn off on it, but it was a 40 dB attenuator. Now what this does, all this does is this knocks down the level of signal going through it by 40 decibels. So four decimal places, it'll move. So if you put a thousand watts through this thing, in theory, only one watt would make it out. Now it's only rated for two watts maximum input, right? But if you put one watt through, 0.1 milliwatts are gonna go on the other end. Now, what is this useful for? Well, if you're too close to your receiving signal, it might be, uh, it might be pegging the meter on your receiver all the way to the right, and you can't get a good bearing if every direction you point it is completely, uh, completely as full as your radio is capable of receiving. So you can take the little BNC attenuator. Uh, these come in many different styles, right? The different connectors. Um, since I use BNC connectors for all my radios, I just have a BNC to BNC. And I just plug it on the end of my radio and then plug my cable into this end. And now all of my receiving signals are 40 decibels weaker and I can get a bearing on something that's extremely loud and extremely close, right? Uh, so that's really handy to have as well. Um, you can also use them for uh, my little super low power transmitter. 
was going through one of these attenuators so uh, so that I wasn't putting out a full watt of power. I was putting out, uh, you know, 0.1 milliwatts, and that was plenty to try and direction find something uh, 30 feet away. So if you're testing your gear as well, you can use these uh, hooked up to a transmitter uh, to make a nice low power signal to direction find.